Hello everyone, Lore Master of Sotek here, and it's time to get back to work in this new year of 2021. We can only hope that it will be much better than the last year, but at the very least, there is much, much to talk about. First and foremost, the day we have long awaited as a fantasy community is at hand. Games Workshop has shown their cards, and we now have confirmation about roughly when the revived setting of Warhammer Fantasy, known as Warhammer The Old World, will be taking place. I don't want to keep you all in suspense, so let's cut straight to the chase here. The reset of Warhammer Fantasy begins sometime soon after 2201, when King Lewin Orkslayer takes the throne of Bretonia. So first, let's discuss the evidence supporting this point on the timeline, and then we can focus on the ramifications for all the various races of Warhammer Fantasy given this starting point. The most obvious piece of evidence is of course the new reveal a few weeks ago by Games Workshop, showing off the slowly expanding map of Warhammer the Old World, which this time includes the great nation of Bretonia. Now much like in the case of the Empire reveal some months back, while the land and cities on the map are familiar to the fans and lore masters of Warhammer Fantasy, the names of the leaders in these various places were quite different. The hot speculation was that this would take place during the time of the Three Emperors, but I found the evidence for that to be bizarrely loose. While there indeed were four large factions noted in the Empire, the names and borders drawn onto the map didn't line up well to any particular time we had explored in that chaotic age. Plus, this age of civil war lasted 400 years, which didn't really narrow things down a bunch. With the arrival of King Lewin Orkslayer, however, we can now be 100% certain that this setting takes place sometime after 2201. Likely a good number of decades, as from the notes of the orcs being back on the warpath and building up in the northern lands around Caron, this probably will be after Orc Slayer has earned his reputation for purging much of Bretonia of Greenskins from his declared errantry war. So, for all intents and purposes, we can confidently say that Warhammer the Old World begins roughly 300 years before Karl Franz is elected to be Emperor. To be frank, while I am a tad disappointed that many of our favorite human characters will not be returning to the revived world of fantasy, I am quite excited for this particular dart on the timeline, because the world of Warhammer is about to plunge into one of the most fascinating, yet least explored, events across its entire history, the Great War Against Chaos. Now, I'm sure you're all quite curious about who of the various characters that we all know and love will be reappearing along with who might be showing up as playable for the first time. We will do a separate video going down all the characters and discussing if they're around and if so where they're at, but today we're going to focus more on what the overall races of the Warhammer world are up to during this time period and who are their important characters that we can look forward to. As I was discussing earlier, with King Lewin on the throne, we know this has to take place sometime after 2201, but before 2302, which is when the Great War reaches its climax. I honestly think that the setting will start only a handful of years before 2970, so that players can be introduced to all the major factions and characters, and then the timeline will begin lurching forwards towards the Great War Against Chaos. We do have some further evidence leading towards that theory, but we'll get into that a little later when it's relevant. Let's start with Bretonia, as with them, we actually have enough information to firmly grasp what exactly is going on. In the lands of chivalry, the Bretonians are enjoying a time of relative prosperity under the rule of King Lewin Orkslayer, who, as his name might suggest, focused much of his rule on purging the land of greenskin filth, as the orcs had actually become a pretty substantial problem before he took the throne. So, for those who worship the lady, I'm sure you're beyond excited to finally be getting that long-awaited update since 2003. 
We don't know too much about the current new king of Bretonia, Lewin Orkslayer, which is honestly going to be the case with a lot of the characters we'll be mentioning today. There's going to be a couple of new names, and the people that are new, like I said, this age is pretty unexplored, so we may know their names and like a handful of deeds, but that's going to be it. All I can say for certain is that we know he was a mighty warrior, and being a Bretonian, he'll be mounted on some kind of beast, whether a horse, a pegasus, or a hippogriff. He'll have a deep hatred for greenskins with a fiery passion, and he is noted as one of the greatest kings in Bretonia's storied history. A true hero to lead all of your knights and nasty little peasants into battle. But he's not the only powerful leader that roams the chivalrous lands. Because, of course, the Fey Enchantress is also still around. This avatar of the Lady of the Lake is familiar to you all. Or is she? There's actually quite a bit of mystery revolving around the Fey Enchantress. Some claim that Morgiana Le Fay, the one we're familiar with, has always been the one and only Enchantress. That she may not even be human. While others suggest that when the Lady's physical vessel dies she is immediately reincarnated into a new individual who carries on the mantle of the Enchantress. Regardless of the truth, the Fey Enchantress has gone by different names over the millennia, and there's no telling whether the one who will hopefully be appearing is Morgiana or maybe one of her predecessors if that is the case. As for the remainder of the realm, not all is well in the lands of Bretonia as a great evil is soon to be unleashed by the Duke of Musion. Looking at the map, it's curious that the Duke of that cursed land is simply noted as de Musion, which of course just means of Musion. They have a Duke right now. This is most likely Duke Maldred, who along with a sorceress consort of his, attempted to steal the throne of Britannia in a series of horrid acts that culminated in the affair of the False Grail, in 2297. This involved Duke Maldred capturing and imprisoning the Fey Enchantress using sorcery to claim he had found and supped from the grail of the lady herself until his schemes were uncovered, which led to the siege of Musion that lasted for three years. It was only ended by a horrid disease known as the Red Pox, which would be his ultimate undoing as while Duke Maldred and his consort attempted to hide in their fortress from the deadly illness, it managed to claim their lives all the same. This would be the final event that would cast down the city of Musion forever after. Never again would it be allowed to have a duke, as the city descended into a repulsive and evil place full of nightmarish creatures, undead monstrosities, and plague. The Great War Against Chaos then entered its final stage, as the Ever Chosen himself descended from the Chaos Waste towards Kislev. Perhaps, many of the knights who survived this disgraceful civil war will be eager to ride north to the aid of their neighbors. Or maybe they'll be too busy with the rising number of orcs gathering around the northern mountains, known as the Pale Sisters. Time will have to tell. Meanwhile, in the lands of the Empire, the time of the Three Emperors is in its twilight stage. The land of Sigmar has endured much over the past few centuries, most notably the Vampire Wars, where the men of the Empire battled against the sinister undead legions of the Von Karsteins. Vlad, Conrad, and Manfred all threatened the nation in their various ways, but each was ultimately defeated. This is already history by the time we'll be starting the new setting in, however, as roughly over a hundred years have passed since the famous battle at Hell Finn, where Manfred von Karstein was finally cast down. The story of the Empire will likely revolve around a very famous hero, who is well known to fans of Sigmar's folk, and the only man who proved capable enough to unite the warring factions of the Empire into a singular nation once more. Magnus the Pious. I highly suspect that we will begin focusing on the time in which he first will begin stepping into the spotlight as a humble man of Nuln, whose incredible faith in Sigmar and fiery oratories set into motion the reunification of the Empire, as well as the greatest alliance of order seen until the end times, 
to face off against the hordes of chaos. Hopefully, we'll be seeing him march out to meet with the various characters noted on the Empire map, and bring them together under one banner, lest they all face doom individually at the hands of the Ever Chosen. Magnus is not the only legend of note, though. There's a very high chance we'll get to see the first patriarchs of the eight colleges of magic, including the first supreme patriarch and lord of the Light College, the staggeringly powerful wizard by the name of Volans, whose staff to this day is used as a mark of office for whoever is ruling as supreme patriarch, nowadays being, of course, Balthazar Gelt. For the remaining factions, in the desire of not having this video last 100 years, we'll be just kind of trying to skim what they're up to, along with any particularly important characters present at the time. The general timeline we'll be looking at is around the 2270 ballpark, give or take a few decades, as that is roughly when the events of the Great War Against Chaos are noted to start churning into motion, though the actual invasion of Kislev and the big climax of the war does not start until 2302. Speaking of Kislev, we already had it confirmed by Games Workshop that the Lords of Bear Cavalry will be returning in style, as well as being playable for the first time in decades. This is, of course, incredibly exciting news. They will likely be led by Tsar Alexis, who, Alexei, Alexis, one of those, who ruled over the frigid land of Kislev during the Great War, and led the defense of the capital during the Battle of Kislev's Gates, even managing to strike down the leading champion of Nurgle at the time, Valmir the Reaper. For the Warriors of Chaos themselves, their story in Warhammer the Old World will of course focus on one of the most mysterious yet important characters in all of Warhammer Fantasy, Azavar Kool, the twelfth ever chosen of Chaos and easily the most famous next to only Archaon, the last ever chosen, and Morkar the Uniter, the first. I deeply hope we'll get to watch the rise of Kool and how he claimed the mantle of ever chosen before launching his massive invasion of the southern lands. Azavar is easily in my top three of Warhammer characters that I desperately wanted to have explored in much more depth, so I'm quite excited to see him lined up as one of the major antagonists in the new setting. Of course, he's not alone. There are many famous champions of the Dark Gods who cropped up during this time of legends, including the likes of Engra Deathsword, Valnir the Reaper, Kolek Sun Eater, and plenty more. Staying with Chaos, let's talk about the Beastmen specifically, because there's actually a lot of interesting things going on with them around this time. While many of their kind definitely joins forces with the other hordes of chaos under the Ever Chosen to bring about the end times, the most important events for the Children of Chaos revolve entirely around the Wood Elves of Athel Lorin. Now, looking at the map for Bretonia provided to us by Games Workshop, they make a note that these two elf face symbols here are controlled by the Wood Elves. These are areas they own. So we have Athel Lorin and the Forest of Arden notated with these marks. This is extremely interesting, as during the reign of King Lewin Orkslayer, a bunch of important events go down in the ongoing conflicts between the Wood Elves and the Beastmen, known as the Secret War. One of the greatest battles that happens is in 2231, when Morgur is reborn within the Forest of Arden, and the Wood Elves attempt to slay the Corruptor while he's still young. Despite the strike force being led by great heroes such as Erloth the Bold and Nyeth the Prophetess, ultimately their attack ends in failure, and many Wood Elves die as the zealous beastmen swarm over them to protect the Gave Spawn. The Forest of Arden at this point falls deep into corruption, but 15 years later, in 2246, Araloth would return at the head of a mighty host of Azrai that faced off against Morgur and his hordes once again. This time, the Lord of Talzin proved successful in his quest and managed to slay the Corrupter by burning the monster to ash using rare sap harvested from the Oak of Ages itself. Not only that, 
but the remaining sap was used to heal the forest of Arden and restore it to a wholesome and healthy wood, securing its control under the rule of the Wood Elves. Based on the fact that Warhammer the Old World map shows the forest of Arden under Wood Elf control, I suspect this tells us that our setting will take place after Morgar's death, meaning the timeline bumps up to a beginning point of 2246 at the earliest. In any event, the Beastmen are by no means put down by Morgar's death. If anything, it almost seems to make things worse, as the largest Beastmen assault in millennia takes place. Only six years after the Lord of Skull's death, the Beasts of Chaos are united under the malefic control of Malagor the Dark Omen, who leads a colossal invasion of Athel Lorin to wipe out the Wood Elves once and for all. And he didn't come alone, by any means, for another famous beastman joined in his conquest, none other than the Syntagor Gorus Warhoof, the sire of a thousand young. Not all of which are simply Syntagors, for Goros fathered many nightmarish horrors into the world. This war culminated in a great battle between the Beastmen, Wood Elves, and even the High Elves. For the Phoenix King, Finnebar sent what forces he could to aid the Azrai in this time of need. But we'll focus on that conflict another time. Ultimately, the Beastmen were defeated and scattered. But I do hope we'll get to play through this legendary conflict. When it comes to the climactic finale of the Great War Against Chaos, we actually don't have much in the way of records of what exactly the Beastmen were up to. Of course, no doubt many of them joined up with Azivar Kul, as there is a solid 50 years between the wars in Athel Lorin and the invasion of Kislev. We can say for certain, though, that Malagor the Dark Omen and Gorus Warhoof were alive and well, not to mention that's more than enough time for Morgur to be reborn and grow to maturity. So look out for the return of these champions in Warhammer The Old World. Moving on to the Wood Elves, since we've already covered so much about them, for the most part, they were recovering from their wars against the Beastmen during this time. Though, about 20 years before the invasion of Kislev, there was the unfortunate incident where King Orion goes insane and unleashes one of the largest wild hunts ever seen against Bretonia, massacring a ton of innocents as his insanity infects the Wood Elves into berserker-like rage. He would face off against the chivalrous Duke Fredfar of Quinells, who, against the counsel of his fellow dukes and lords, rode out to face the monstrous king in the woods in hopes of ending the suffering to his people. Unfortunately, he stood no real chance, and was massacred along with his army of knights. This left the garrison of Quinells perilously unprepared for battle, so Orion invaded the city and was only stopped when the Lady of the Lake herself intervened as he charged into her sacred grove at the city's heart. Although it is not well known exactly what occurred in this moment, the following dawn, Orion led the Wild Hunt away from the ravaged city to Athel Lorin, where he committed ritual suicide in a pyre many months earlier than ever before. As for the final years of the Great War, the Wood Elves mostly focused on staying out of it and defending their own borders from Greenskins, Beastmen, and Skaven. However, Queen Ariel did secretly send a band of warriors led by Scarlock the Hunter to aid the Everqueen as she was being pursued by the greatest and most powerful of the Keeper of Secrets, Nakari. Only a few of the Azrai survived this quest, but it proved critical in aiding Ulthuan during those dark times. Speaking of which, the High Elves and the Dark Elves were quite busy during this era in the timeline. For as the Ever Chosen prepared to unleash his great invasion of the Old World, so too did Malekith the Witch King scheme his own assault against Ulthuan. In fact, the final thrust of both invasions occurred at the same time, as the Dark Elves sought to exploit the efforts of Chaos to their own gain in the oncoming conflict. 
the hag sorceress Morathy even went so far as to seduce an entire legion of warriors of chaos that were heading towards Nagaroth into serving her. The Northmen all too happy to join alongside the Druki so that they might despoil and loot the rich lands of Ulthuan. Malekith unleashed the entirety of Nagaroth's might against his hated enemies, many black arcs landing upon the isle to disgorge their legions. The full invasion began in early 2999 and lasted until the decisive Battle of Finneval Plain in 2300, where the Druki were at last defeated with the seeming death of Malekith. Prior to this war, the Dark Elves had focused much of their efforts simply on raiding across the world and consolidating their power. Towards the end of the century is when the Witch King took notice of the Rise of Chaos and made his plans to take the Phoenix Crown for himself. As for the Asur, before the invasion of Malekith's legions in 2999, they had only just started adjusting to the rule of the newest Phoenix King, Finnebar the Seafarer. In the decades leading up to the Great War, the High Elves were mostly occupied with maintaining their realm and occasionally marching out to aid potential allies. Finnebar had traveled the world before taking the throne and believed that the security of Ulthuan lay in embracing friendly relations with the other races, as opposed to the policy of his predecessors, which focused on isolationism. It was Finnebar who convinced the prior Phoenix King, Belhathor, to open the city of Lothurn to trading with humanity. It was Finnebar who unleashed a mighty naval force to aid the Wood Elves when an unprecedented beastman invasion swept through Athel Lorin. It was Finnebar who pushed his Grand Admiral, Sea Lord Islan, to aid the other realms of order when possible, thus causing the powerful alliance between Iceland's fleet to the dwarf navy of Badakvar under King Grundadrak. That managed to finally destroy Wa Gutripa, which had been plaguing the Black Gulf for some time. Not all was perfect in this time, however, as the rising tide of chaos in the far north had effects upon Ulthuan itself. Most notably, the demonic invasion of Yivres, where Moranian, the father to Eltharion the Grim, managed to defeat the nightmarish hordes. Things, of course, would become desperate when the Great War began in earnest, and the legions of destruction landed upon the shores of Ulthuan in such numbers that they were nearly unstoppable. The island home of the High Elves suffered immensely during this war, and they only narrowly achieved victory thanks to the heroic efforts of the famed twins Tyrion and Teclas. In the aftermath of the Battle of Fenival Plains, the nations of men called for aid, but the elves still had many battles ahead of them, cleansing their realm of Druki and Chaos armies. So, to the aid of humanity sailed only three individuals, each an incredibly powerful archmage. Teclas, Fenrir, and Yertle made the voyage across the great ocean and arrived in time to join forces with Magnus the Pious. Here, Teclas would instruct the human wizards who had answered the call of Magnus as they marched north to Kislev. The archmages joined in the battle at the gates of Kislev, proving critical against the powerful sorceries unleashed by chaos sorcerers, bray shamans, and greater demons. Although Yertle would fall during the battle, the forces of order claimed ultimate victory, and Teclas stayed for a time to found the Colleges of Magic at the request of Emperor Magnus, teaching the first generation of battle wizards. The elves, of course, were not the only race that came to the aid of humanity during the final years of the Great War Against Chaos. The brave Dawi of the Karaz Ankor had been mostly focused on internal concerns leading up to that terrible war. High King Alrickson had been in the throne for less than a century by the time the Ever Chosen marched out of the Chaos Wastes, a terribly short amount of time by dwarf standards. When the call for help arrived, many of the dwarves argued that they owed nothing to the people of Kislev and should focus on their own woes. But High King Alrickson refused to hear such cowardly talk 
and ordered that as many Dawi would march to the city of Prague as possible. Time was of the essence, so the force that ended up marching out was small but incredibly powerful. It included many heroes you should be familiar with, such as the legendary rune lord Crag the Grim, who was already around 1500 years old by this point, and, of course, the soon-to-be king, Prince Thorgrim Grudgebearer. High King Alrikson was incredibly brave and a mighty warrior. He arrived too late to save the city of Prague, but shored up the defenses at the capital of Kislev itself. Here, his troops fought side by side with their Kislevite allies and reaped a great tally against towering demons, indescribable monsters, and endless hordes of crazed Northmen. Sadly, the High King would be mortally wounded during the battle at the gates of Kislev, though he would prove too stubborn to die until Thorgrim proved himself and was selected to be his successor two years later. For the remaining races of the Warhammer world, they are mostly undocumented during this period, minus a few small notes, so we're just going to speed through the following. In the nightmarish depths of Skaven Blight, the Greyseers summoned all the clans back to the capital in 2302 in hopes of bringing an end to the Second Civil War. They perform a massive ritual that succeeds in summoning the Great Horned Rat himself into reality for a short time. So, while the legions of the Everchosen descend upon Kislev, the Skaven meet with their god, who devours many of his cowering followers before blessing them with the 13-sided Black Pillar. Touching this pillar is required to ascend to the Council of Thirteen. The Skaven who claimed their seats that fateful night ruled until the fantasy world is destroyed over 200 years later, meaning that the Council of Thirteen you're familiar with is the exact same one that ends up taking power during this fateful evening. Truly unified for the first time in an age, the Skaven spend the next 18 years attacking the nation of Tilea and raising many towns close to the Blighted Marshes. Meanwhile, when it comes to the undead, the vampire counts are mostly up to quiet affairs in this age. The infamous Red Duke lurks in the forest of Shalons of Bretonia after his second defeat not too long ago. Moving on to the undead, the vampire counts are mostly up to quiet affairs in this age. The infamous Red Duke is lurking in the forest of Shalons of Bretonia after his second defeat. Meanwhile, the ruined city of Musion is claimed by the undead in the aftermath of Duke Maldred's death to the Red Pox, and Manfred von Karstein, believed dead by most, is outmastering his control over the various sorceries of necromancy and forming pacts with the mysterious spirit wraiths of Nagashazar, who worship the great necromancer. He spends the great war against chaos observing the conflict to formulate his own plans, though also quietly defends Sylvania from any potential threats. Finally, Waldekir Rotep, a vampire lord of the Necrarch bloodline, wages war against the weakened province of Ostermark in the aftermath of the Great War Against Chaos in 2304. The gruesome battles stretch on for over a year before the undead lord is at last slain by the hero, Stefan von Kessel. Looking over at the Tomb Kings of Nehekara, the mummified kings from the Land of the Dead are mostly occupied with the lands of Norska during this time. In the 2280s, a good ten years into the slow rise of Azovar Kul, Setra the Imperishable leads the largest invasion the Tomb Kings have launched in millennia against the Norskans. Enraged by their theft of his crown and numerous other trinkets, in addition to having slain him in combat, the King of Kings gathers up all the might of Nehekara and smashes his way through the snow-covered lands of the distant north. Over the course of five years, from 2281 to 2286, the Imperishable butchers everything his skeletal legions can find from one side of the frosty continent to the other, culminating in a titanic battle between the armored legions of the Dark Gods 
and the forces under Cetra. The War of Sand and Snow, as it's known, rages until the Kimrikara successfully recovers every single coin looted by the Norskins, and murders any of those even remotely related to the incident that took place the decade prior. During the final stages of the Great War Against Chaos, there's no record of exactly what the Tomb Legions in the Land of the Dead were up to, though Cetra should undoubtedly receive some credit for no doubt drastically reducing the population of Norska, at least until after the Great War's end. The final note for the Tomb Kings is that in 2350, only a few decades after the Everchosen's defeat in Kislev, the combined forces of Archon the Black and Kalida did invade the Cursed Land of Sylvania, where the Serpent Queen smites the Vampire Lord Mandragon, while Archon loots the Staff of Dagash from the Abomination's coffin. Over in the steaming jungles of Illustria, the Lizardmen enjoy a relative time of peace leading up to the Great War Against Chaos. Although they're having minor issues with constant forays into the jungle by humans, dark elves, and of course the undead of the Vampire Coast for the last few hundred years, no major battles took place. This came to an abrupt end with the rise of Kool, whose ascension to Everchosen caused immense pressure to be placed upon the Great Warding, as the Dark Gods sought to aid their champion in his southern invasion. The Slan sensed this great disturbance, and focused on aiding in the best way they could, uniting their sorceries and calling upon the power of the Geomantic Web to strengthen the Great Warding in 2302 during the battle at the Gates of Kislev. This lessened the might of Chaos during that final battle, banishing countless demons as their grip on the physical plane slipped and granting the defenders enough relief to strike down the Everchosen himself and claim ultimate victory. The Lizardmen would face their own great trial less than 20 years later, however, when the wrath of the Dark Gods would descend upon Lustria. In 2321, the prophecies warn the Children of the Old Ones of impending doom, when the sun will be stained black as it rises. For an entire week, the Great Warding flickers, allowing tides of demons to manifest all across Lustria. This results in thousands of battles raging across the continent, until the sun finally resumes normalcy and the legions of chaos vanish just as suddenly as they arrived. Speaking of demons, the true manifestations of chaos, of course, play a massive role in the Great War. Thousands upon thousands join themselves to the horde of Azivar Kul. Meanwhile, an impressive legion of Slanesh demons participate in the war on Ulthuan, as the greatest among their Keeper of Secrets, Nakari, is unleashed by Malekith and utilized as a horrifying weapon until the greater demon is just barely defeated by Tyrion, Teclis, and Alariel the Everqueen. It is more than possible for all the classic favorites and many new demons to appear during these apocalyptic conflicts. Of course, Bellicor is lurking around as well, for as of our cool would need to have been crowned by the first demon prince in order to claim the title of Everchosen. The last of the Chaos races, the Chaos Dwarves, are not well established as major players during the Great War Against Chaos. It is hard to imagine how the Dawizar would not get involved in such a massive conflict, so hopefully their participation will be greatly ramped up in Warhammer the Old World. At least, we can hope that'll be the case. Finally, the Greenskins and Ogre Kingdoms were busy, but quite chaotic during this period. The many thousands of Greenskins in Troll Country found themselves displaced by the Titanic Legions of the Everchosen, so the orcs and goblins quickly busied themselves by either attacking the Chaos Worshippers or essentially joining up with them to fight anybody that the Chaos Warriors managed to miss. Further across the world, the Greenskins had a number of major wars going on, battling against Lewin Orc Slayer in Bretonia, recovering from their recent defeat at the hands of High King Alrixen in the World's Edge Mountains, and suffering a major loss in the Badlands at the hands of the High Elf and Dwarf Naval Alliance in the Black Gulf. For the most part, this was not a great time for the orcs and goblins, 
with no notable characters really being around beyond rumors persisting that Gorbad Ironclaw had somehow survived his crushing defeat centuries earlier. However, a certain legendary fat goblin looms only a couple short centuries on the horizon. As for the ogres, much like the Greenskins, they get swept up in the Great War by essentially joining both sides. Many hundreds, if not more, embrace the legions of the Dark Gods and join the Everchosen to bolster his horde with Chaos Ogres. Even more, make the journey to the Empire in Kislev, as the Ogres sense the impending conflict, offering their services as mercenaries, which leads to entire tribes marching alongside Magnus the Pious and Tsar Alexei to battle against the forces of Azivar Kul. There is a note that when the defeated armies of Chaos fled from Kislev, a great many marched east in their attempts to retreat to the Chaos Wastes. Unfortunately for them, this immense column of marauders, beastmen, and warriors found themselves ambushed by those eager ogre tribes who had missed out on the big scrap at Kislev. The worshippers of the Dark Gods were massacred, and the Noblar scrap launchers of those particular tribes had a curious tendency to use pieces of chaos armor and weaponry as ammunition for many years afterwards. That concludes the various races and what they're up to, at least with the information we have currently available. As you can see, there is a ton of stuff going on, with many of the races in the Warhammer world leading up to the Great War Against Chaos. Let me know down in the comment section which event or war that we talked about has you the most interested, that you would want to get to play through. The Beastman Invasion of Athel Lorin? The War of Sand and Snow? The Rise of the Everchosen as of our cool? Or one of the other mentioned topics? I'd love to hear back from y'all on your thoughts about this age we find ourselves in. Ultimately, I suspect the timeline for Warhammer the Old World will begin in about 2250, since the Wood Elves seem to have already purified the Forest of Arden. I really hope we don't miss out on that huge Beastman War, but we'll have to wait and see. The Great War is said to begin in 2270 at the earliest, so I think that's the latest we would end up seeing the setting begin at. What do you think? In any event, thank you all so much for watching. I will be back pretty soon with another video where we will just go down the list of named special characters in Warhammer Fantasy, discussing who is alive, and if so, where they might be. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.